My name is Lenny Labrizzi. I work for Grow NYC. Probably most of you know something about Grow NYC, the farmers markets, the markets. Some of you, I think, are involved with composting. So I know there's uh, compost drop-offs. Some of you may know about my department, which is the um, Open Space Greening Program. We work with community gardens uh, throughout New York City. Uh, my job, a lot of my time, depending on what year it is and what, where the funding is, goes into uh, rainwater harvesting. Um, and I've been uh, at Grow NYC for 26 years now. Um, so I, I'm sort of curious about, when I, when I do these talks about rainwater harvesting, I'm sort of curious about what people know and where they're coming from. So I just want to get an idea of the folks here. Um, how many of you are, would call yourselves urban farmers? Community gardeners? There's a difference, right? Um, what else are you? Engineers? Um, researchers? Educators? Educators? Composters? Composters. A lot of composters here. What else that you didn't mention? Designers, architects, organizers. Organizers. Um, anybody have connection to rainwater harvesting at all? Um, anybody over 30 here? <laughs> when I was coming here, I said, I bet you I'm going to be the oldest person. Okay. When, I, when I was your age, there was a saying, never trust anyone over 30. So here I am. <laughs> um, so, rainwater harvesting. I'm glad I, I followed, um, I didn't get your name. Will. Will, I, I followed Will because I remembered that um, had a sign that sort of kind of explains what rainwater harvesting is. It's basically an ancient practice. We're not in reinventing the wheel here. It's people that have been doing it forever. Go to um, ancient ruins and you'll see some kind of system that ancient civilizations set up to collect the rainwater and bring it where they needed it for their drinking water, for their irrigation, whatever. Um, and we're just doing it in an urban setting, which people really don't think about so much because <coughs> you turn on the tap and you've got fresh, clean water. Um, well, that's fine for New Yorkers. It doesn't happen anywhere in the world. Um, and another point I'd like to make when I talk about this stuff is, so how much of, the, of our globe is water? Three quarters. Three quarters, right? And um, how much of that is fresh water? How much? Three percent. Very good. Somebody knows her stuff. Um, how much of that is available to us as drinking water? Of the three percent. Point two. What is it? Ninety-seven percent of one percent. Ninety-seven percent of one percent. Point nine seven. So there's much. There's less than one percent of all. And even though our planet is water, um, less than one percent of that. I think it's actually point three percent of the whole total is drinking water that's available to us. So most of the water is temporarily, at least, locked up in the solar um, Greenland ice caps. Um, hopefully that doesn't disappear quicker than the projections say. Um, but very little is available as fresh, clean drinking water. We're very blessed here in New York that we have this great little, or well, big, um, watershed that's supplying us with our fresh drinking water. Um, but for agriculture, we really don't need potable water. We don't want polluted water. You know, we don't want to pump water out of Newtown Creek and, and, and water our plants with it. But we do get um, a lot of rain here in New York City. We get, which city gets more rainfall, Seattle or New York? Mm -hmm. New York does. Mm -hmm. Even though everybody thinks of Seattle as this rainy place, it's just that they get it all bunched together for nine months out of the, nine months of the year. 
and in three months they get none. So they have a different way of, of rainwater harvesting. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit. But anyway, so we don't have to use the water out of the tap to, to irrigate our gardens. Um, we can conserve water by doing that. Uh, but also, um, to get to what Will was talking about before, we can also prevent pollution because by capturing the water that comes on falls on rain uh, rooftops and collecting it in rain barrels, um, that means that that water is not going into the sewage treatment plants. Some of them, you know, a quarter inch of rain and almost all of them fail, all the sewage treatment plants fail. Some, um, as little as uh, a tenth of an inch of rain. Um, and if we get one inch of rain in New York City, we collect about five billion gallons of water that just falls on the land in New York City every time we get one inch of rain. Mm -hmm. A square foot of roof, one foot by one foot, can collect six tenths of a gallon of water. And bring it with me because it wasn't charged. I lost power in my house. But um, if you have an iPhone or an, an iPod, you can get an app to figure that out. It'll actually calculate how much rainfall you can collect off of your 20 by 100 foot roof. Do you know the name of that app? Uh, I think it's Rainwater something. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, type into um, the iTunes store Rainwater Harvesting or Rainwater, you'll get. There's a couple of them that do pretty much the same thing. So Somebody I, I um, mm. I'm sorry? Somebody hacked that app. Hacked it? Oh, made, for that app. made a new one? <laughs> oh, no, never mind, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I did bring along a display just to kind of give you a picture of what being what harvesting is. It's basically a simple thing. If you don't have a gutter on the structure in your garden or on your farm, um, you need to put a gutter on, obviously, to collect the water, otherwise it's just going to fall off your roof. Um, and then, normally, your rainfall will go down your downspout and, in many cases, um, into a sewer, directly into a sewer, or onto the sidewalk. In a garden, that's not so much the case, because it'll, and, and again, thank you, Will, but he, he you know, preface this, this talk a little bit, um, but, but having urban farms, blue roofs, green roofs, is a way to, to capture some of that rainfall and, and get, get it into the soil and not let it go into the sewage treatment plants. But anyway, it would normally go this way. Um, you, you need to divert it, though, in order to capture the water. Um, because you don't, in New York, we can't collect water all year round, right? Winter time, what happens? We get, Snow. except for last winter, we usually get a really cold winter where, where water will freeze. Water becomes ice, which is, and it expands. It'll crack all of this stuff, including brass, plastic, whatever you, whatever you have water inside of that doesn't have any place to go. It'll crack. So you need you can only collect water here during the frost free months. And anyway, if you have a garden, unless you have a greenhouse, you're not really using that much water in the wintertime anyway. So it's it's a perfect match for um, a, a product, water, that or a need that we have for our farms and a use, which is growing crops uh, of all kinds. So um, you want to divert water from going this way to come into your tank, right? And what we found was that um, oops, a toilet plunger works really well <laughs> to stop this up. It doesn't work perfectly. Um, because that's why I have this bucket here, because it'll let a little bit of water drip. And um, if any of you want to try this out, um, I set it up to circulate so that um, you can see how it all works. But uh, 
this part here. So that fits nicely on there, stops the water from going this way. This is what's called the first flush. So we're collecting from rooftops in New York City. We know how wonderful clean air we have here. But whatever, things get deposited on the roof in between rainfalls. The first rainfall that comes flushes all of that stuff off. And the first water that comes off is going to be the dirtiest water. So you want to kind of try to separate some of that from um, the relatively clean water that you're going to get here. So that's what the first flush does. That is a, is a reservoir that will collect water, the dirtiest water, and then let the rest of it, after that fills up, come into the, into the tank itself. Manually operated thing, it just, it's just got a valve here that after each rainfall, you've got to um, drain that out, close it back up again so it's available for the next use. Um, a couple of other ways that could be done. This is a really cool product which I have on my rainwater system at home. Uh, it basically replaces that T there, that diverter, and the first flush pretty much in a way because inside of here is a screen filter. Okay. So then this is in here. Rainfall comes down here, hits the screen, and then is forced to come out this way into your tank. Um, in the wind, and if you, if you get crap in here from your gutters and downspout, you can just clean this out and put it back in. But also in the winter time, you turn this off, and now the water does not go into the tank, but comes out the bottom where it was going before. Nice little um, German product. That's around the box. You can order it. Uh, there's no store. There's no rainwater harvesting store in New York City. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, right. Um, but that that's a really cool product. Although it does cost about a hundred bucks between the product and the shipping. Um, so, I mean, I, I felt part of what I wanted to come here and talk about was, well, this is what we do. These are kind of the pinch points and where maybe a little product design would be helpful. So if anyone can come up with something that works better than that or that, that's less expensive, um, it's a good thing to work on. Um, with bigger tanks that um, we, a lot of the gardens will have tanks this size, 1,000 gallons, 750 gallons because um, they can use that amount of water. Somebody with a small little backyard garden maybe could get by with this. Um, but in a bigger um, community garden, this won't even be enough to, to handle the irrigation needs. Uh, but this is a, a, the company, um, rainwatertanks.com or watertanks.com, American Tank Company, they sell the bigger tanks, and the tops of the tanks have a much bigger opening, which is called a manway. A little bit sexist, but that's all right. And actually, uh, a, small, a smaller person, usually a woman, would have to get it fit in there. Cause it's a little bit too big for a man to fit in, uh, although I can fit. Um, anyway, so this sort of does the same thing. It, it's not the diverter, um, but this is a nice filter screen that would go in the top of a, of a bigger tank. And the, you know, the water would come in here, you'd still need to do a diverter. So this is another type of screen filter device. Um, water comes into your tank, you've got a spigot to drain it. Um, we almost always raise the, the barrel a little bit off the ground, at least high enough to get a watering can in, because um, that's how people will, will, will um, be able to water from a tank like this, um, because uh, 
you're only getting gravity flow out of the tap. As soon as the water, if, if I was holding the hose up here and the tank was filled up to here, nothing's coming out. I have to bend down like this to water my plants. And then you're still only getting a little flow. When the tank fills up, you also want to have an outlet for the water overflow so that um, you're not building up pressure in here or backing up the water up and then having, you know, causing leaking problems. So an overflow is another part of the system as well. And that can be diverted to go into a rain garden um, or into an area of the guard of your garden space that could handle extra water. Um, obviously away from the building you're collecting off of a building. Um, so those are the, the components of a rainwater harvesting system. A roof, a gutter, some kind of piping to get into your tank, um, some way to drain the tank, and then an overflow for it, and then a way to shut it off in the wintertime. I mean, you could just disconnect the thing in the wintertime. You don't have to have diverter necessarily. Um, depends on your usage. Um, <clears throat> so the other part of what I have here is uh, this bicycle powered water pump. And that, that's sort of how I, I got here. Um, I was uh, connected to Audrey. Where is she? Right here. Oh, there you go. Um, um, and, and now I'm sort of connected to this whole group of um, human-powered, bicycle-powered people that are out there that are, that are coming up with these great things for uh, using in farms and gardens and other things. And, and I had a sort of back-and-forth uh, email discussion with Audrey about uh, doing a leaf shredder. Did you show that off this morning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you all got to see that as well. Because um, um, I think that's another thing that gardens really need or could really use because getting all those leaves in big giant piles, if you can you know, lessen the volume and, and hasten the, 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 the composting of it, uh, it's, it's, um, it's going to make all that much more useful and make us be able to, to create new, new um, good soil. But anyway, um, I looked at books like this. Um, looked online for designs on, on, a, on a pumping system because um, for a couple of things. First off, as I mentioned before, you're not getting any pressure out of, the, out of this tank. You, even if you raise the tank, anybody have a clue about how high you would have to put the tank in order to get the same pressure that you get out of your hose or your sink at home? Six stories. Six stories. Six stories. Thirty. Uh, Sixty feet. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two atmospheres. Yes. So we're not putting any sixty foot <coughs> towers up out there. So we're not getting pressure. Um, so <coughs> I said, well, maybe we can use a bicycle to do the same thing. And so that's why I um, came up with this little gadget here. I wanted to do something that um, was easily replicable, that could be done with off-the-shelf parts, uh, that you know, nobody had to um, weld anything. The only thing I had to do was grind a little piece with a grinder to fit from one piece into another. And you guys can come, I didn't want everybody to come up all at once because it would be too crowded, but maybe one by one you can come up a little later and just see the connections. But uh, I adapted this um, trainer to um, be able to connect up to a drill pump. Right? Real basic, simple $10 pump. You can use a much more expensive pump that will maybe give you a little bit more better efficiency, but you're also spending a lot more money. Um, and that's easily replaceable. There's a couple of angle brackets on there to hold the thing steady. Um, and a couple of clamps to clamp everything into place. But otherwise, uh, that will this will pump water 15 feet in the air easily. Um, 
and also give you some pressure. So if you wanted to run an irrigation system, if you happen to have a lot of young people mm -hmm. around that you, you, you want them to burn off some energy, <laughs> go ride the bike for 10 minutes. Uh, anybody want to give it a try? Any volunteers? Nobody in the bike rider? Uh, so I've, ha I've got this rigged up right now to... Um, um, I've got this rigged up right now so that when um, she r rides and, and gets it going, that the water is coming out of there. Can you hear it? And just going back into the tank so that I can do this at a, a fair or something and have people ride to their heart's content and never run out of water. <laughs> um, but as you can see, it works perfectly fine. Um, a little bit of leaking problem there, but you're always going to have... That's the biggest problem with doing any plumbing. Get into things and not And no matter what you do, um, there's great stuff. You can hear the water coming into the tank. Anybody else want to keep one try? <laughs> Um, yeah. What is that? Um, is it the pump? That mechanism that is spinning that the tires? Is here? Yeah. It's it's a drill pump. So it's designed to fit on a power drill. Yeah. And people will use it if they need to pump out water out of you know they have a little bit of water in their basement and they don't have a, a big sump pump or something. It'll it'll make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's an impeller pump. Uh, if you want to be technical engineering about it. What do you think? Uh, some more resistance than I thought that would be. All right, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's definitely good exercise. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the potential for uh, pollution in rainwater in New York City? Yeah. Um, well, so we've been doing rainwater harvesting since uh, about 2001. By the way, that was the last time we had a severe drought in New York City. And since then, the weather patterns have changed drastically. But anyway, so we had this group called the Water Resources Group. Uh, and we met very regularly for about three or four years. And from the get-go, we said, well, you know what? We go on city rooftops and all kinds of crazy stuff goes on there. People throw diapers on the rooftop. Pigeons poop there, the rats are running around doing whatever they're doing on there, uh, all kinds of nasty stuff, right? Plus whatever is falling from the sky. Uh, um, so we said, well, we need to test the water, right? So easy thing, right? Just test the water? Not so easy. Because you've got to figure out well, when are you going to test it to really know what's going on. You're testing it right after it rains? Are you testing it after it's been sitting in the tank for a while? What temperature are you testing it at? What are you testing for? So luckily we got um, a water testing company to, to donate like tens of thousands of dollars of water testing uh, ability for us. Um, and the guy who worked for this company and came to our meetings, he would come um, to, to gardens and collect several carboys like this full of water and had to fill out paperwork because then you need a, a chain of custody. So you're not saying, well, somebody must have poisoned that water. That's why the levels came out. So, um, um, so they tested the water um, and for like every known thing and basically eliminated lots of stuff because people were like, oh, look, this is nasty stuff, this PVC that we use. Isn't that a problem? That wasn't a problem because you didn't find anything that would come from the PVC. You did find some heavy metals. That's the big problem in urban, in urban areas. It's the problem with soil, the problem with the air, the problem with the water. And lead. So, I don't know how long, we haven't had lead, lead and gasoline in New York in like forever. Um, but there is leaded 
gasoline in places like China and Mexico, and and we have a and as much as we have a global economy, we have a global environment, and that stuff somehow floats around in, in the air. And if we just happen to be the spot where it lands, we're getting some lead positive on our rooftops. Um, there. I think aluminum showed up a little bit, and that it, that might have been the case because very often aluminum is, is in the paints that's used to coat the rooftops. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Was there anything that was beyond the EPA specifications for drinking water? Yeah, we have signs we put on barrels that say, do not drink the water. <laughs> it's not potable. But in your past. Um, so, it, it, no, it doesn't meet drinking water standards. We did test two drinking water standards. And then the interesting thing is, there's not really good um, irrigation standards. And every place has different standards. Even for drinking water, the EPA, New York City, DEP, New York State Department of Health, have all slightly different standards for what is allowable in drinking water. Um, and then irrigation water, there's even less of agreement on anything. Although a lot, you know, there's more allowed in, in irrigation water than is allowed in, um, in drinking water. Um, and very much like uh, testing your soil, you test your New York City soil and for unlimited, unrestricted use, and no soil in New York City is going to pass that test. Um, so basically that's what we're, we're coming up with, is that we have not over the top levels of um, contamination. Oh, and the other thing, so lead somewhat, aluminum somewhat, and the other thing is bacteria, right? You. Um, the only reason our drinking, what's, why doesn't our drinking water have bacteria? Chlorine. Chlorine. Mm. So the only way to have bacteria-free water um, is to put chlorine in it. So we, we do actually, we, we do, well, there's ultraviolet also that, that we wear. Is that what you were going to say? Um, and there are systems that, um, one called SODIS, S-O-D-I-S, it's a solar disinfecting system that uh, is used a lot in places like India where if you, you can put water in a plastic container, like a, you know, a, something like that, um, and um, <clears throat> expose it to the sun, I think for six hours, and basically will kill any bacteria that's in it. That's um, ultraviolet. Ultraviolet rays will do that. Um, so, but we do um, have a, a maintenance manual. By the way, GrowingYC's website, GrowingYC.org, rainwater slash rainwater. You can find a manual for um, how to build a rainwater harvesting system, um, and also um, the maintenance of it. It's a little brochure part uh, that that gives you recommendations for how to maintain your system, including if you're concerned about bacteria in the water, just adding a small amount of, like a 50 gallon barrel like this, I think will take like two tablespoons of, of uh, bleach to disinfect it. Um, but your soil is filled with bacteria. You know, a teaspoon of soil has six billion living creatures in it. You know, and some of those are bacteria. Maybe not the ones that you're going to find in the drinking water, but or in the in the in the water barrel, but um, similar ones. But you can you can treat it with um, chlorine if you feel necessary. Does that does that answer your question? Well, I mean, I'm I'm much more concerned about heavy metals and lead right. um, than bacteria. Well,